My name is Chris Givens. I'll be reading John chapter 20, verses 19 through 23. It was still the first day of the week. That evening, while the disciples were behind closed doors because they were afraid of the Jewish authorities, Jesus came and stood among them. He said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. When the disciples saw the Lord, they were filled with joy. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father sent me, so I am sending you. Then he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you don't forgive them, they aren't forgiven. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Chris, thank you for reading the scripture for us today. We appreciate that very much. So congratulations making it to the end of May. Yeah, uh, many weeks ago now, I made some comment that, that time just accelerates from January through May. It just begins to fly by. And next thing you know, you're like, wow, we're already at the end of May. So, so you're here. That's a good thing. And, and I think we get to this point where we finally have a three-day weekend. Right? I can just kind of feel like I can breathe. We just kind of slow down. It's okay. Because, I mean, May is, a, I mean, the whole spring is busy, but May is, May has crazy. I mean, it's, it's especially difficult when we're doing church planning thing for things, because May is just nuts. Because there's, well, there's Cinco de Mayo. That's a joke. I'm just, that's a joke. Of course, there's Mother's Day. That, I mean, that's, that's an important time. I mean, and our car show here that same weekend takes a lot of our, uh, volunteer time and effort it's a, it's a big deal for us and, and then for those who have uh, kids uh, uh, in school or, or you work in education well may is crazy because you've got all the finishing up assessments you're doing tests projects grading and then there's the after school parties and then there's the graduations and i don't know about even for those of us who don't have kids at home who are in school it, it just seems like may is a crazy crazy month and so we finally get to this point where we can just take a breath. And I really think, I really believe that's part of why it's so easy for us to lose sight of what the Memorial Day weekend is all about. Because I think we're just so darn tired by the time we get to the end of May, we just forget. But we don't want to forget that. I mean, we don't want to forget that. We don't want to forget the people who, uh, through their uh, service and their sacrifice, uh, made our made freedom possible, made made it possible for us to have a crazy month of May. So, so we don't want to lose that. We don't want to lose that meaning, and we want to remember that. This year, uh, Pentecost Sunday, today, also falls in the midst of Memorial Day weekend. Now, Pentecost Sunday is, you know, it's not one of the, uh, the, the, the two big ones, of course, are Christmas and Easter, right? In the, in the Christian world, Pentecost comes in number three in terms of the one that, we, this is one we really point to. This is an important one because this is the, this is the time we commemorate the birth of the church, that it was just uh, a, a bunch of people gathered around Jesus until the Holy Spirit came and it gave birth to the church. So it's a uh, it's a very important day for us, and interestingly, in the, on the day of Pentecost is also a theme of freedom and service. So Pentecost Sunday is connected generally to Acts chapter 2, right? I mean, that's the more common reading uh, of what happened that day, Acts chapter 2, uh, that, that Jesus had been with the disciples after his resurrection and appearing to people for around 50 days, and then he told them to wait in Jerusalem uh, so, and, and the Holy Spirit would come to them, and that's when he ascended into heaven. So they go to Jerusalem, they're waiting, we sometimes call that the upper room, they're waiting in a place, and this would not just be the, at this point, 11 disciples, this would be like all, his kind of entourage of followers. So quite a few people are gathered in this place, when all of a sudden, it's like this mi mighty wind that blows through the room. And they begin speaking in languages they had not been able to speak before and they began speaking in languages so that they could be able to speak the good news of Jesus Christ to other people to all the world as Jesus had said be my witnesses in Jer Jerusalem Judea Samaria and to the ends of the earth 
And then they saw what looked like tongues of fire above the heads of the believers. As a matter of fact, it was so noisy that people, passers-by outside, heard it. And were like, what in the world is going on in there? I mean, it's just, this is, they're crazy. They must be drunk already. It's too early to be drunk. But they're... So it was just this very dramatic experience. Very dramatic. But that was the beginnings of the church. Well, there is another version of the disciples receiving the Holy Spirit. And that is in this scripture passage from John chapter 20. So, uh, John's gospel is unique. Uh, if you've read the gospels much, you know John is very different than the others. Um, there's many distinctive things about it, and, but the pattern that you're gonna, we're going to see is the same kind of pattern as what happened in Acts chapter 2. And it's that pattern we want to notice today. Some of you have probably seen the movie, A Man Called Otto. If you haven't, you ought to. A man called Otto, O-T-T-O. It's streaming on Netflix. I get no royalties from saying that. But it is, it is starring Tom Hanks. It is a, it is a, great, uh, a great film. Uh, Otto is a man, an older man, who has just retired, uh, not by his choice, but he's retired. And we've, you learn that just a few months prior, his wife had passed away. And so for Otto, all that he had cared about is gone. All that he cared about was gone. He cared about his work. He cared about his wife. He took care of those things. And now they're gone. And he did not see a reason for his life to continue. I mean, he was in a very dark place. You might say he was captive. He was trapped by grief, disappointment, anxiety, fear, all kinds of things. And he saw no reason that his life should continue except as you went through doing things people would ask him to do something or he would just happen into a situation and he would always do something that that went well it it benefited people but it annoyed him it just annoyed him he was like all these people are idiots i just want to go home he wouldn't see that what he was doing was making a difference even a very dramatic situation where he saved a man's life and he was just like, oh, I'm getting out of here. <laughs> he couldn't see that the, there, were these, there were these interactions, these interruptions, interventions in a sense. He just he couldn't see it. He was trapped. He was in bondage to the grief and pain that he had. But one of those really important interruptions that happened in his life was a, were some new neighbors that moved in. Uh, uh, Marisol and her family uh, husband, two daughters, and she was expecting a third. And uh, she was relentless to reach out to Otto. I mean, took him things, took him food, knocked on his door, asked him for help. I mean, just oh, she was relentless. In his, and even as annoyed as he was with her, she was graceful to him. She was full of grace. And she laughed, and she tried to get him to laugh. And he still didn't quite break out of it. But eventually there was, there was that time. There was that time that there was an incident with some, with some of his neighbors. Something was said, and he was like, oh, the way I act impacts these people's lives. And it was like a big aha. That, but, but it had finally gotten through, right? Those interruptions, those interactions, it finally got through. Oh. And he began to serve his neighbors he began to see that there is you know, there is a so that to his life so consider uh, the disciples of Jesus in this scripture uh, they had they had believed that Jesus was the real deal this truly is a man sent from God who's going to lead us into a time and a place that the kingdom of God can come to earth and that will mean that these Romans will be out of here and we will once again rule our homeland they kind of equated returning to uh, ruling their land with the kingdom of God. And Jesus is the real thing. He is a man sent from God. This is going to happen. And then, of course, Jesus was betrayed. He was arrested. You know, the trial, crucifixion, laid in a tomb. So talk about being in a dark place. 
They had invested all of their hope and their energy and their belief in this person named Jesus. And now it's gone. It's over. Now, earlier that day, Mary Magdalene and some of the others had gone out to the tomb to finish you know, the process of preparing the body. And Mary Magdalene comes back and says, I have seen the Lord. But here they are, these, these disciples, later at night now, it's dark, and they're behind closed, locked doors. Even the news of Mary Magdalene that they had, she had seen the Lord wasn't enough. Well, friends, this is, how, this is the pattern of how God works. You see it all through the Bible. It's, this is the pattern of how God works, that, that, um, that God's people are trapped somehow. They are in a situation that it can often, and what they experience is grief or disappointment, anxiety, fear, duress, um, all, the, all the bad things. And they don't see how, how in the world they can break out of that. They don't see any hope at all. And so, so they, are tra- they feel trapped, they're in bondage, and so God intervenes. God interrupts the process and provides a way out. It's what we frequently refer to as salvation. God provides a way for them to move beyond the difficult spot because they can't fix it on their own. And God sees that and says, that's not my intention for them, I'm going to make it right. And they, and they do. And there's always a so that there's always a so that they are now out of that out of bondage to that situation that are out they are no longer trapped in that situation they are no longer held to that situation because now they and so so that they can now worship they can bless others they can serve others there's a so that always with it so let's walk through the scripture uh, just a, a little bit because there's some really uh, things that we have, to, we have to make sure we're clear on here. So, uh, first off, like I said, they're behind locked doors. They are afraid. They are full of fear. Because they fear the Jewish authorities. And, and I feel the need to say a little bit more on that, because some translations simply say they fear the Jews. And there are people who will point to that verse and say it to justify their anti-Semitic hate speech. No, that is a complete misunderstanding of what this is meaning. They're afraid of the same people who betrayed Jesus. They're afraid of the same people who were in collusion with the Roman officials who set Jesus up. They're afraid that those people are going to be coming for them to eliminate his followers. That's, what, that's who they're afraid of, not the Jews. They're afraid of these Jewish authorities, these people who have betrayed Jesus already. And so in the midst of that kind of fear, Jesus appears. Jesus is there and says, peace be to you. Peace to you. Peace, shalom. A sense of, I can catch my breath, everything's okay. Everything's okay. He shows them the scars in his hands and his side, and they are full of joy. They're full of joy because Jesus is here. He has intervened, right? They were trapped in grief and disappointment and fear and anger and all these things, and God has intervened. The risen Jesus has appeared to them. And so then Jesus breathes on them. Now, I know that may sound, that sounds kind of weird. You're in a gathering, someone comes in and breathes on people. That, that sounds kind of odd, right? That sounds kind of odd. But the word here. This is the only time this word is used. It's kind of, since we don't read Greek, we don't pick up on it. It's the only time this word is used in the New Testament. The only time. And the other place you will find that word in Hebrew is in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. When God had formed the humans and breathed life into them. So this, this means... That Jesus is sharing this creation power breath, this creation spirit with the disciples. This is no small thing. 
And he says, receive the Holy Spirit. You have to receive it. God doesn't force us. He says, receive the Holy Spirit. In the movie, Otto, and all of those uh, different interactions and interruptions, he couldn't receive, he just couldn't receive. I was not at a place to hear or to experience that people truly appreciated him. He truly made a difference in their life. He just, he couldn't, he couldn't receive it. We have to be open to receiving what God has for us. And so, then, as God sent Jesus, Jesus sends the disciples. This is mentioned many times. Matter of fact, this is the seventh occasion that Jesus says something to the effect of, the Father has sent me, and so I'm doing what my Father wants me to be doing. So he says, the Father has sent me to do these things, now I'm sending you. The disciples the gathered people are sent people, right? I mean, it's not that God saves us from a situation simply so we'll be more comfortable now. It's, there's a so that. There's always a so that. So the last verse that was read, that Chris read a moment ago in this section is, if you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you don't forgive them, they aren't forgiven. Well, here again, we need to be clear about this. If you don't forgive someone's sins, they're not forgiven. I mean, do you think Jesus is really giving that kind of power to the disciples to determine, well, you can be forgiven, but you're not forgiven? Okay, no. That, that, that runs counter to the, to the teaching of the Bible. So we have to understand what John means when it comes to sin and forgiveness. To John, the gospel writer John, he sees sin as that separation from God, that estrangement of God. And I don't even understand what God is trying to do. I'm, uh, it could be I'm willfully closed off to it. It could be I've never had the occasion to think about it. I've, but I, there is this separation from God. See, to John, sin is not just a, a list of moral do's and don'ts. It, it's not just, oh, you did that. Whew, that's not good. No. It's that you're completely separated from God. Because if, you're, if, you're, if you get it, then you can begin to understand what it means to live the life God has set before us. So forgiving someone is helping them to see the light. <laughs> forgiving someone in, in this context is helping somebody to understand that God loves them. It's, it's, the, it's I'm here to serve you and help you, help your life be enhanced. That would be the acts of forgiveness forgiveness it's not the usual way we think of it but that's the way john talks about it in his gospel because god loved all the world remember he sent his son for all the world so around this same time in the calendar is the time that people of jewish faith are commemorating something a little bit different uh, well, let's go back to Exodus. Remember, they were slaves in Egypt, right? Cruel Pharaoh, it is a hard, hard life. They are trapped, they are in bondage, they are oppressed. There's, no, there's nothing they can do to get out of it. So God sees that, and God says, hey, I'm going to make a way for you. He, sends, he, he intervenes, he sends Moses to confront Pharaoh. Things don't go well for a little while, but then God starts with the plagues, Right? sending the plagues, and so finally, right before the 10th plague, which was uh, going to be the angel of death moving through the area, God told them to be prepared, and here's a meal, I need you to eat the meal, and do it this way, and it's known as Passover, it's Passover, and so, and so then, they were able to leave Egypt, they're free, and they go out into the wilderness, and as they're making their way, they come to the foot of Mount Sinai, and Moses goes up on Mount Sinai and uh, is given the gift of the Torah, or the Ten Commandments. The law is the first time they have something codified to say, this is how we will live as God's people. And the people celebrate the giving of the law. And so even today, in the Jewish faith, there are many who will celebrate Passover, and 50 days later, celebrate the feast 
of Shavuot, or the Feast of Weeks. And one of the things they do is they'll, they'll spend all night studying the Torah as a gift from God to tell us how to live. You see, the things that we do, it doesn't come from nowhere. It comes from a long history of understanding that God does intervene in our world, does intervene in our lives, so that we can be freed, we can experience freedom in order to love and to serve. Jesus gave us an excellent example of that when he gathered his disciples and pulled out the wash basin and the towel and washed their feet, which was the, the task of the lowest servant in the household to wash the feet of the, of the guests. And he said, this is what it looks like. This is what it looks like to serve other people. See, Otto finally saw how much his life meant to others. And he spent the rest of his years helping his neighbors, checking in on people, fixing things that needed to be fixed, and helped Maritzal's family immensely. I, I was talking to somebody not too long ago about, that had uh, been involved in working in a church ministry, and they were feeling just a little frustrated and, and maybe dejected and thinking, I don't know, anything I've done has really made a difference. So I had some questions of things they had done, and I said, I said, look, this is my experience. I'm telling this is from my life. I look back, and I can say, you know what? I remember when so-and-so sat down and chatted with me for a while, and they asked me questions nobody had ever asked me before. I can remember when someone did that, and they probably don't even remember doing it. But it was that interruption in my life, and it helped me to come to believe it helped me to see the light so know that someday someone is going to be doing something and they're going to think you know i remember when so and so helped me in a very difficult situation but you provide the light for others so pentecost reminds us that god interrupts our lives to get our attention and to provide freedom life so we can live the life god wants us to live so that we can love and serve others you and I have received God's interruption, God's blessing, so that 